Good evening. It's Good Friday, April 10th, 2020. I'm, for those of you who are not familiar with me, I'm Brian Walter. I'm an elder at Grace Bible Fellowship. Tonight we're going to be talking about the heart of the cross and things related to Good Friday. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, give us reason, our Father, to acknowledge our sins before you. Give us reason to worship you with our hearts this evening. Give us reason to walk with unsaved others that they may come to faith in you. Help us to more fully understand the cross. Amen. The cross speaks of that which is so shameful, so horrible, that it should not be mentioned in polite society. It's a quote from the Roman orator Cicero, who, uh, as a member of Roman society, was familiar with what the cross was and, and the agony that went with it. As we reflect on the cross this evening, we remember the cruel punishment, humiliation, and rejection that Jesus Christ, our Savior, endured for us. But what was behind all that? What was Jesus' heart thinking? We look at the journey to the cross and reflect on the heart of Jesus and how little hints are left along the way, hints of how our hearts should be like his. Luke 9, 51 to 53. Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Jesus has determined to go to Jerusalem. He knows it will be the last time he makes that journey. For there he will meet death. In that journey, he leaves important teachings our hearts need to know. Wisdom that a dying man imparts to his heirs. Wisdom that pierces the heart just as his own heart is pierced by the ignorance of men. But we continue. Luke 9, 54 to 56. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. The heart of Jesus is to save lives. Lives imprisoned by sin, life, and how we lead it matters to Christ. Jesus proclaims his purpose. He hints at his final earthly destiny, a death that will save lives eternally. So we should be seeking to save the lost. Luke 9, 62, But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Christ has set his face for Jerusalem and he is not turning back. Jesus had a heart for plowing. He broke up the ground for us that we may bear fruit. There was no looking back for Jesus, nor is there for us if we are to be fit for the kingdom of God. Luke eleven thirty three to 36. If, in case you haven't noticed, we're going to be going through a lot of Luke this evening. No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body is also full of light. But when your eye is bad, your body also is full of darkness. Therefore, take heed that the light which is in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, the whole body will be full of light, as when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. Jesus is the light of the world. So we should be a light. We see the cross in this passage. Ironically, the light of the world, Jesus, took on all the darkness of sin, so much so that the crucifixion at that crucifixion, the skies were darkened. He defeated that darkness with forgiveness. Luke 12, 4 to 5. And I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that have no more they can do. 
but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has power to cast into hell. And yes, I say to you, fear him. This is said by one who was feared by the religious leaders and killed by crucifixion. After that, they had no power over him. But he continues with verse 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two copper coins, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. To God, what is the value of your life? Are we just sparrows in his eyes? No. He values you. He values you enough to die for you. Luke 12, 32 to 34. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches or moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We see the heart of Judas in this passage. His treasure was here on earth. Christ's treasure is believers. Christ's heart is with us. His heart was with us on the cross. It was why he went to the cross, and we will be his heart's treasure in heaven. Luke 13, 10 to 13. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. And he laid his hands on her. And immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Here we see the heart of Jesus being moved by the crippled woman. So I ask, how long did your infirmity of sin cripple you? How long did it make you so bent over you could not escape it? Remember what happened when Jesus came into your life and called you? Hasn't Christ's heart been moved to heal sin's infirmities by the cross? Hasn't the cross laid its hands on you? Luke 13, 34. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. Here we see the heartbreak of Jesus over a lost world. He walked among us, but we did not walk with him. His arms nailed to the cross were wide open. His voice is still calling. Can you hear it? Luke 14, 11 to 14. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Then he also said to him who invited him, when you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Do you see the heart of Jesus here? Jesus humbled himself to the cross and was exalted. That act was an invitation for us, the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. We are blessed because he accepted that invitation to his feast. And like poor sinners, we cannot possibly repay him. Luke eighteen thirteen, And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, have mercy, be merciful to me, a sinner. Does Jesus hear our pleas for mercy? He does, even though our sins, like a crown of thorns, pierce his head. His healing blood is applied to our hearts. Jesus answered to a rich man who desires to follow him, Luke 18, 23 to 24 and 29 to 30. But when he heard this, he became very sorrowful, for he was very rich. 
And when Jesus saw that he became very sorrowful, he said, How hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. So he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or parents or brothers or wife or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present age, present time, and in the age to come, eternal life. This is spoken by the same Jesus that left his family to carry out his ministry. The one who became poor by the world standard for the sake of the kingdom. The one who suffered on the cross as his mother watched. So strong was his desire to bring salvation to you. Luke 10, 30-35 when Jesus, then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care, to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. Jesus wants us to be good neighbors. Neighbors that bandage wounds. Neighbors that apply healing words. Think about a time of suffering in your own life. With some pithy saying like, every cloud has a silver lining, or when God closes a door, he opens a window, or the reassuring, God won't give you more than you can handle. Would that really lift up your spirits? Probably not. More than likely, you were helped by someone who was willing to enter and walk through your pain with you rather than by somebody trying to cheer you up right away. So I ask you, are you prepared to walk through the pain of the cross? Are you, are you able to engage pain as pain? If we mentally diminish or disregard the evil that Jesus overcame, then we dilute the message of the cross itself. Now, Resurrection Sunday is coming, but if we speak only of the victorious resurrection, we begin to deny the evil and the pain and the suffering of Jesus and of the disciples who followed him. In Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 5, it says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him as stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Jesus has the heart of the Samaritan. Jesus is the good Samaritan. John 11, verses 5 to 35, various verses. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Martha goes to Jesus, and her disappointment is evident in her words. She is upset at Jesus' late arrival. She is almost bullying Jesus into raising Lazarus. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus offers hope of resurrection to Martha. Martha gives the blunt, Yes, I was paying attention in synagogue. Answer, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. 
it was as if she was stuck in the anger step of grieving, and now Jesus is going to ed- and now and now is going to educate Jesus. So continuing on, Jesus said to her, "I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this?" She said to him. Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. Well, Jesus in turn educates Martha, because that is what Martha needed. Jesus keeps it all on an intellectual level, knowing that is how Martha is coping. He easily could have brought her to tears. Martha, on the other hand, once again, gives a textbook answer to her question. She's unflappable and putting on her brave face. Still continuing... After she had said this, she went back and called her sister, Mary, aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary's response was the same phrase as Martha, but her grief is made plain by her tears. Jesus moves from an intellectual level to an emotional one. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Jesus responds not with words, but with tears. That is what Mary's heart needed. Jesus was walking through this with Mary, meeting her needs. His tears were tears of comfort. John eleven thirty six to 44. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. Then Jesus, again groaning in himself, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister, the sister of him who was dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he's been dead four days. Well, that's Martha, always trying to keep it real. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead man was lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. Now when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound, hand and foot with grave cloths, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to him, loose him and let him go. Do you see how Jesus grieves with his sisters? His compassion and tears are evident. He walks in their shoes, then he raises the dead Lazarus. Jesus on the cross feels our sin. His feet traveled with ours. All the sadness, all the weeping will be gone at the resurrection, but for now, he walks with us and revives our dying hearts. He does this through the cross. He does this through his resurrection. He comes out of the tomb to the amazement and joy of many and he silences the mourners. Matthew 21, 1 to 3. Now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me, and if anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord has need of them, and immediately he will send them. Here we see Jesus getting his disciples involved. As disciples of Jesus, he wants to get us involved into ministry also. He wants to be involved with us. He may ask, what can I get for Jesus? Either bring donkeys or be the donkey. Jesus will ride you through paths of righteousness to his praise. What more could we want? Luke 19, 35 to 38, Then they brought him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. 
And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. Then as he was, as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. This passage harkens back to the angels at Jesus' birth. But the key here is king. That's the key word. Blessed is the king who comes. Jesus is our king. His earthly coronation included a flogging and a crown that was made of thorns. His earthly throne was the cross. Now his throne is our hearts. How are you treating your king? John 12, 20 to 27. Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and asked him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. When the Greeks came to Jesus, they were ready to receive him as their Lord, and Jesus knew their hearts. He knew that this hour had come to fulfill the purpose of God for all men, both Jews and the rest of the world. No longer would he be limited to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as if the triumphal entry into Jerusalem was not enough, Jesus exclaims, he is yet to be glorified. Metaphorically, he is the seed that dies. He is the seed that produces an abundance of seeds, seeds that will grow and grow his ministry past Israel to the Greeks and the entire world. Still, Jesus does not lay claim to this glory. Instead, he knows that he is in the hands of the Father. So Jesus says, for this purpose, I came to this hour. It was his Father's purpose. Every hour is an hour to be like Jesus when helping others and when suffering for doing so. Luke 19, 45 to 48, Then he went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in it, saying to them, It is written, My house is a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. And he was teaching daily in the temple. But the chief priests, the scribes, and the leaders of the people sought to destroy him and were unable to do anything, for all the people were very attentive to hear him. Has the cross driven out the den of thieves in your heart? To this day, there are leaders still trying to destroy the witness of the cross. Be attentive to hear Jesus, even in your suffering. Forgive them. They know not what they do. And he looked up, and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put in more than all, for all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God, but she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood that she had. Many sacrifices were offered to God throughout the Old Testament. Certainly many sacrifices were offered at the time of Passover when Jesus was in Jerusalem. Jesus had no lamb to offer not even a sparrow, yet he gave all the livelihood he had. He gave it for God, and he gave it for you. John 13, 3 to 12. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel with which he was girded. 
Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. And after doing that, he says, So when he had washed their feet, he sat down again. He said to them, Do you know what I have done for to you? Jesus washes his disciples' feet. He knows they need washing. He meets their need even though they were ignoring it or unaware of it. Is Jesus at your table? Is he washing your feet? Notice that when Jesus washed you clean from your sins, his feet were nailed to a cross. Luke twenty-two fourteen to 23. When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to question among themselves, which of them it was who would do this thing? The communion of a meal. It's not the first meal he had with his disciples, but it is the last one. A meal we have observed at Grace Bible Fellowship many times. You might have been here. You might have been exhorted to examine yourself. When Christ examines you, what will he find? A pretend Christian? Who would do this thing? Luke 18, 1 to 7. Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was a, in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man, nor was. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him, saying, Get justice for me from my adversary, and he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because of this widow's troubles, me I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? In Matthew 26, this is 30, verses 36 to 44, we see the persistent prayers of Jesus in the garden. He prays three times to God. His heart will not give up. Three times to the, po to the point of sweat like blood dripping from his brow. His heart is broken but resigned to carry our burdens. All of this foreshadowed in a past parable. Luke 20, 9 to 15. Then he began to tell the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard, leased it to vine dressers, and went into a far country for a long time. Now at vintage time he sent a servant to the vine dressers that they might give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the vine dressers beat him, sent him away empty handed. Again he sent another servant, and they beat him also, treated him shamefully, and sent him away empty handed. And again he sent a third. And they wounded him also and cast him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Probably they will respect him when they see him. But when the vine dressers saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Let's come and kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. And so it was that Jesus, the beloved Son, was crucified. The sweet grapes of the vineyard were for naught, sold off at some market or fermented into wine, 
or vinegar. John 19, 28 to 30. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on hyssop, put it to his mouth. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. And so it was that Jesus, the beloved son, was crucified. How sour the taste of that wine vinegar in the mouth of Christ as he cries out, it is finished. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. If you are a believer, you know this. We know Christ walks with us even when we sin, even when sin brings us sorrow. Yes, sorrow gives us a way to victory. Yes, sorrow gives way to victory, but to grasp the victory, we must grieve that sorrow. It is our ministry to have the heart of Jesus. It is our ministry to reconcile others to Christ, that the heart of Christ may reach them, that they may become the righteousness of God. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God demonstrates his love. He gives his Son in the process. Is this something beyond belief? Can you see the heart of God? Has God touched your heart? Is he walking with you? First Peter 2.24 Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. And Hebrews 2.9 But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death, for everyone. Yes, this same loving Jesus, the one who ministers to people where they are at, he is one who ministers to us through the cross. If we do not engage with and understand our need for him and the world's need, then how can we properly value what he offers? He offers life in abundance. How can we grasp how wonderful that is if we turn a blind eye to sin and death do the seemingly unbreakable and to the seemingly unbreakable gift grip of sin in which the world is held. What good is it to say that the Lord of life entered death, that the sinless one bore our sin, if we refuse to look at sin and death for what they are? Hebrews twelve two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes, this same loving Jesus, the one who ministers to people where they are at, are the ones who minister to us through the cross. Faith is the biblical term which embraces the total response one makes to the grace of God. One must accept Christ's death on their own behalf. Hebrews 7.25, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You must claim redemption through his blood, Paul said. In Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. 
In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus, the one who suffered a brutal death at the hands of humans, he holds not a grudge, but desires to accept those who believe in him. Are you having second thoughts about believing Jesus? Luke 12, 32 to 34. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell what you have and give alms. Provide yourselves money bags which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus knows where your heart is. Where is your heart this evening? May it be like Jesus focused on the treasure of the cross. Our Father in heaven, now how we thank you for the cross. You know our lives with all our pain as we are flogged by this world, as we wear a thorny crown, as it were, and as it were crucified by this world. We know that Christ walks with us through all our sin and sorrow. He walked with us on the cross. Lord, we thank you that you understand when we have dark days because you went through one too. We thank you that you did not leave us for dead, but have bound up our wounds and healed our hearts. Lord, help us to do that for a dying world. Amen.